And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Let's pray. What a great day it is, Father. Let me just bless you. It is the day that you have made, and we rejoice and are glad in it. God, we thank you for your word that from Genesis to Revelation doesn't change, but still convicts, still encourages, still changes lives to this day. Help us, help us to be changed by your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Good to see you. <laughs> you have it straight? <laughs> yes. As all of you know about the eclipse that's supposed to come, supposed to come this weekend, I doubt we're going to get any part of it or get left out. That's okay. But it seems like so many, I mean, you can't turn on any news, you can't look at any news, everybody's going to talk about the eclipse. Even if they can't see it. It's like the world is focusing on something that may not impact the majority of people. And I'm not preaching about the eclipse, but uh, I'll get to the, this in a minute. But I, the Lord began to speak to me. I mean, notice that God still speaks. Hello. Whether by an unctioning in your, in your spirit or sometimes through a dream or sometimes through an audible voice. I believe God can still speak through an, even an audible voice. I believe and I expect God to speak. If you're not expecting God to speak, you may as well just go home now. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to, please. But I expect God to speak. And I expect God to speak when I'm in church. I expect God to speak when I'm with other believers. I expect God to speak when I see the flowers that are starting to creep up. Creep up. Uh, they are, by the way. Uh, I, I expect God to speak through many different ways. Now, most of all, you get, can only get past the natural realm of things, honestly. So many people, well, uh, uh, they talk about God and, and God in nature, and that's expected. Read the scriptures. It's expected. It's normal. It's called a normal revelation. But I believe God can speak through more than just nature. You know, I believe it's more than just driving down the road and seeing a fire. Oh, there must be a God. Well, no kidding. But I believe that God can speak through many other ways. And most specifically, He can speak by His Spirit through His Word. Amen. And I believe that no matter, if, no matter what anybody tells you, if you can't go back to the Word and confirm it, it's a lie. Because I believe that the Bible is that accurate. But I also believe that it's not just a book. Now, here, you see, here's where some people in church differ from other people in churches. Some people will come, oh, I heard a good story today. The pastor preached a story about Adam and Eve out of the Bible. Isn't that just. But for some, it goes beyond. I've said this for years that we have to get beyond the text because God is speaking something more than just a historical reference. Now, do I believe the Bible is accurate in historical references? Yes. But I believe God is more than just a history story. Certainly. I, as God was speaking to me through 
this eclipse that I was, you know, I was like, okay, Lord, if you want me to know something about this, tell me. You know, you can't do that. The Bible says if we, have, if we lack wisdom, we can ask. So if you want to know something, ask. But don't ask Google. <laughs> yeah. I'll never forget, um, Scarlett mentioned that before about, oh, months and months and months ago about Dr. Google. Well, I'm sorry, but Pastor Google doesn't exist. God Google doesn't exist. Because I believe that the very Word of God is powerful and living and sharper than a two-edged sword. <laughs> So as I was asking God to speak to me, all these stories came to my mind. And I may get to a couple, I may not get to a couple. It doesn't really matter because I didn't come here to tell you a story. I, I, as all these things are flooding my mind, I begin to ask God, but God, what does the church need to hear? See, I could pull out, I used to say, I don't want to be prideful, and I'm not going to be prideful because I don't. Do, I would never. I don't do this, okay? Just, but I could just oh, come up here, pull a scripture up, and preach it. But you've been preaching long enough; you can probably do that, God. You can probably do that. Just pull pull scripture out and just preach. I used to have some training, and what we used to do with with new students is we used to take and give them a scripture and give them 15 minutes to come up with a sermon. Some of us would be like, shoot, some of you, if I asked you to preach next week, you'd be sweating. <laughs> so I, as all these scriptures and all these stories are flooding my mind, I had to ask God, but what do you need the church to hear today? What is important for people to hear and understand? Not what I want them to know, but what do you want them to be changed by? You know, they say knowledge is power. You can know something and still be dumb as a bunch of rocks. Yep, you know those people. You know those people. They, I, I, I know a pastor, a, a minister, pastor, Pastor for many years. He had two doctors who could not figure out how to put something together. Now, I probably couldn't either, but I don't have two doctors. <laughs> you, know, you would expect someone with a doctor to be able to do something, but he had no common sense. And all his friends would tell him. See, I'm not here to give you just knowledge. What I, what, what I believe God wants us to hear is what can change our lives. It's what can minister to us and encourage us and edify us Sometimes you, we need that, don't we? Sometimes I can be a little stern when I preach, but my goal is always to encourage you in the Word. Because it's the Word that can change your life. It's only, it's only the transforming power of the living Word of God that can do anything. You shall... Uh, I guess two weeks, two weeks ago, sent me a thing from uh, the, our daily bread or days of praise. Daily bread. Love the story, but something that was in it struck her, and so she had to send it to me. It was about encountering the the living God. I'm afraid there are many people that are in churches today that they're hearing a story without encountering the God of the story. I, I, as all these scriptures, and I, I'm beginning to pray, and I begin to ask God what he wants us to hear, I went back to this scripture in Genesis chapter 3. And most of you probably know this story of Adam and Eve, and them being tempted by the serpent and falling into that temptation. And eating from, not the apple tree. It's not an apple tree, folks. It was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Not an apple. 
They say a, a, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. Well, what's the evil part about it? Maybe the seeds. I don't know. But it wasn't an apple tree. But we know the story of how they ate from the tree. Their eyes were open. And then, as per usual, God is coming in the evening. <coughs> literally in the breeze, walking. There's a lot of things I could get to today, but I, I want to make sure that what I share is what God needs you to hear. Okay? As God was walking, and his presence was getting nearer and nearer to Adam and Eve, they could hear him. And as he got nearer and nearer, the Bible says they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. I'll share just a little bit today about the presence of God. You ever get around somebody, maybe in a group of people, and there's one person in there that just stands out? Maybe that one, that one person just has something, whatever it is, that just attracts people to them. And everybody wants to talk to them. It can be a room full of people, and yet one person can be the attraction. Kind of like the class clown in some cases. Kind of okay. But everybody wants to be around that one person, it's, it seems. You can sit in a crowd of people and be the loneliest person in on earth, so to speak. You can sit among a bunch of people and not saying you're alone, but you can still be lonely. It's a horrible feeling, isn't it? You can be in a crowd of people and feel like you're the only one there. Some of you have experienced that. I've had times like that. And I have to keep going by the promise and words of Jesus that says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. You see, even in the midst of being in a room of people and being, being lonely, there is one who stands beside you. You see, we sang a song this morning about He abides, about the comfort abiding with us. You see, Jesus promised when He left, He said, I'm not going to leave you alone, but I have someone else, the Paracletos, who is going to come by and stand at your side. <clears throat> I'm telling you people, the presence of God is very real. God never intended for us to be alone. God never intended for a believer, for one of his children to stand there and say, I feel lonely. But sin separated because when, when God walked down and came down and they began to hide themselves, it was the beginning of something that wasn't good for, for mankind. Because of sin, because of sin, it separated them from the presence of God. Sin will tear us up. Sin will destroy us. The Bible says the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That's what sin does in our lives. Sin will pull, will pull you away from everything that is good and pure and lovely and of a good report. Adam and Eve were the first to experience this. They ran and hid in the trees. And God says, where are you? Not like God didn't know. Sometimes God's looking for us to stand up and say, here I am. You play hide and seek with a little kid? Where's so and so? Where are you? Here I am. You see, 
God knew where they were, and he knew the reason why they were hiding, but he wanted them to admit to their sin. He said, Adam said, I heard your voice in the garden and was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. You see, sin will pull us back from the very presence and the voice of God. And so that when God speaks, we can't hear. We can't see. We can't understand. I'm not here to preach about sin. I'm here to preach about the solution for sin, which is Jesus Christ Himself. You see, God said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you that you should not eat? And then comes the blame game. <laughs> we always blame everybody else for our problems. It seems like. Adam, Adam says, well, it's that woman that you gave me. <laughs> In other words, put the fault back on God, not even on the woman. It's the woman that you gave me. In other words, God, do you know better? <laughs> now, of you that are married, how many of you believe that God picked your spouse? That's a good thing. But that, that doesn't mean that God's at fault when they do something wrong. Okay? Just, just saying. Okay? When they don't act like you want them to act, that's not God's fault. Okay? Just, just, just saying. Just saying. Adam, of course, says, but it's that woman that you gave me, and, you know, she was the one. You know, first of all, oh, I'm not, I wasn't here. First of all, God gave Adam the rules. Yeah. Second of all, Adam was there. You can't tell me Adam wasn't there. Adam was there. Adam could have stopped it. Mm -hmm. But he was, and please, guys, I'm not going to, this is like a Father's Day message, but <laughs> guys, Stand up. That's right. Guys, do what God's called you to do. Don't be wimps or, you know, don't be a wussy. <laughs> Stand up for what God has called you to do and be the guardian and the hedge that God has called you to be over your wife, over your family, over the church. <laughs> Yes. This is so good, we may have to take up the second one. <laughs> Adam, Adam skirted around his responsibility and then blamed it upon God and the, call, the, 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 the uh, reason, what, 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 the end result was sin and Adam and Eve getting kicked out of the Garden of Eden and not being able to walk in the presence of God. Randy, can you put up our memory verse for this morning? This is what Acts has to say about it. Repent. Everybody say repent. Repent. The Bible says to repent and be converted or changed. Repentance doesn't mean anything unless there's a change. Because change is the result of true repentance. Yes. Repent, therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. We, we sing about the, how the blood washes our sins away, okay? And we like that. We, uh, you know, oh, I'm so glad I'm going to heaven. But can I tell you, I'm just going to, I will get to that in a minute. Life is more than just going to heaven. Yes. If you think you're just going to go to heaven, sit up there, and sit around the throne, and maybe play a harp, you've got another thing coming. I am going to heaven just so I can sit around all day. As an adult with ADHD, that's boring to me. Just, just saying. I expect to be doing something in heaven. Maybe, you, maybe you, your job is going to be different than mine, but I expect to be doing something other than that. So it goes beyond being converted so that our sins can be blotted out. Look at this. He said, 
So the times of, ref of refreshing, they come from the presence of the Lord. I don't know about you, but some days I need a refreshing. I, I need that. There are days, especially at the end of the day after something, you know, a long day, whatever's going on in our lives, we need a refreshing. And maybe for you that's a, in the summertime, that's a cold cup of lemonade or maybe a Coke or something or a coffee or, you know, if that doesn't for you, go for it. But, you know, maybe just sit back and you just, just relax so that you can be refreshed for another day. I, you know, this is I believe, and not this is a, 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 a one-off, but I believe that one of the reasons why the church is so lazy is because we forgot to honor the Sabbath. We get we come to church tired. I'm telling you. How many of you got up this morning and didn't want to come? <laughs> Hello. Sometimes we, sometimes we get up in the morning and it's just like, <sighs> you know, I have a 45 minute try. Boy, it would have been nice to sleep in a little longer this morning. Maybe you had a late night out. Uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe something, maybe you were out partying all night. <laughs> but I, I really believe that because we don't take the time to be refreshed, we can't serve the Lord. We can't get into His presence. The doctor one time told me, for ministers, that obviously ministers can't take Sundays off, except for maybe God. <laughs> <laughs> ministers can't always. So he said, he said, he said, I've seen this. He said, I'm a doctor, and I've seen it happen so many times in ministers' lives where their heart just gets worn out. Physically, their heart is, gets worn out because they've been pressing and pressing and pressing and pressing and they forgot to refresh. He was, he was the kind he told, he told people, I've heard him in, in, in conferences say before, he said, on your day off, turn your cell phone off because if your cell phone's on, you're still on. Yeah. What I'm saying is that the Word says that if we repent and be converted so that our sin may be blotted out, because this opens the door for you so that times of refreshing may come. When, when I'm at my lowest, my weakest, my saddest, my whatever, what, what the cure is for me is to be in the presence of God. Friends, there is nothing like it. And I'm not talking about driving down the highway turning on Caleb. If you do that, that's fine. I'm saying, when, when you can get alone by yourself, just you and God, and say, here I am, I need a refreshing. See, believers don't do that enough. We wait until we've gotten to our worst before we look up to our best. When if we make the presence of God a part of our daily life, and not just make it, it is part of who we are. I believe it will, it will take care of problems. Because I find that when I worship, sometimes the situation doesn't change. But I've just now put it in the hands of a God who is so much bigger than I am. Moses told God, if you don't go with us, we won't go. Look at the next is. He said, if God, if your presence does not go with us, we're not going. Do we make that our mandate first thing in the morning? God, if you're not going to go with me today, I'm staying home. I'm going back to bed. 
Now, please, I'm not condoning, especially if you have a responsibility of turning over and being a holy roller and going back to bed. What I am talking about is making time for God before you make time for breakfast or for whatever else. Friends, I'm telling you, when you honor God with your first, God will, God will bless you in the rest. Amen. Just saying. Just saying. A whole lot of practical areas for that, but Moses said, if God, if you don't go with me, if your presence doesn't go, I'm staying here. Is that where you are today, God? Is that your heart? God, if you're not going with me, if you're not in me in this venture, if your presence isn't going to walk me, walk with me through all of this, I am going to stay and do nothing. Now the goal isn't so you stay and do nothing. The goal is so you find the presence of God. You see, back in verse 8, when it says the presence, that Hebrew word to make it a little simpler, it actually means the face of God. It's the same word that was used in Genesis 1-2 where the face of God was hovering over the deep. You see, even before creation of this earth came into place, you see, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was already here. Well, I can get into this. <laughs> But then God walked over the waters. His face was looking over all of his creation. And he began to do some miracles. And he declared light and birds and fish and cows and all the other things that we see here in heaven. Why? You see, the earth was in a bad place. The earth was dark. And the face of God, the presence of God coming upon it caused a change and caused it to be blessed. Let me bring this back to us. Darkness was over our lives. Sin was hovering over us. The devil had a right to our life. But the face of God stepped in. The presence of God came into our situation. Do you remember when your burdens roll away? Do you remember that night or that day or that whatever, when, whether it was in a car, in a church, at home, or whatever, that God spoke to you, you saw his face, and something changed in your life? Amen. Because the presence of God was there to do a change. Do you remember that day? I do. I don't necessarily believe that you have to, but I, you have to understand that there has to be a change. You see, when we are confronted with the presence of God, one of two things has to happen. First one is, we have to change. That's, either we have to change, or we have to leave. Presence. Why did Adam and Eve run? Because they knew that there was sin. They knew that he had disobeyed God's rule. And instead of changing, because there's, at that point they had no way to change, because their sin was their sin. There hadn't been an atonement yet made for it. So their only other option was to hide from the presence of God. See, with the presence of God, one of two things has to happen. Either you change or you get out of the presence. Now, David said, where shall I go from your presence, God? He even, David even said, I can make my, head in, my bed in hell. Head in hell. My bed in hell, and you still be there. And I hear people tell me all the time, well, God's all around us. Yeah, but do you recognize it? Are you subjected to it? Or are you just doing what you want to do? Here's what we do when we come into the presence of God for a lot of people. Okay. 
We put on our sunglasses to shade us from his presence. We, we, we darken everything around us so that God is not as bright as he should be. If God is not as bright as he should be, God can't change us like he, like he said. You see, we water down, we dilute, we make the gospel so weak that it can't change people's lives. We take it, the word and reduced it, as I said earlier, to the story without understanding that his word is living and it brings his presence. When you get into the word, and please, some of you say, well, I can't read that well, or I can't spend that much time in the word. I, I promise you, just, just a verse a day can change your life. Because a verse a day, if you're serious about it, will lead to a chapter a day. I told you a story. I'm so thankful for my mom who has read the Bible through 41 times. God bless her gizzard. <laughs> but you know what? Unless the word changes her life, she's just read a book 41 times. And if you like reruns, your favorite movie that you've watched 10, 20 times, great. Without the presence of God, without allowing God to change you, that's all you do if you just want to read it. But I promise you, she is, I love this. I love bragging about my mom now. And for many years ago, that was not me. Really not me. But she will sit down now and not only read the Bible, but she, she found out what cross-references are. And she will go to every one of those references and read every one of those references on top of reading. And now she has a journal. That she writes down when God speaks something to her. And she'll take it to her little church that she has in her building that maybe six people come to. They have church in her building, so she doesn't even have to leave for church. See, no excuses, people. <laughs> anyway, she'll take it to church and she'll say, you know what, I was reading the Bible, and this is what God said. Are we excited? And I'm, please, I'm, I can brag on my mom, but are we excited about our own lives when we read the Word? Does it do something to us? Yes. Does it cause something to stir? What's causing those things to stir in you when you read the Word? Is it's the presence of God that's, that is living and powerful, and I quoted this before, and sharper than a two-edged sword. You see, if it was a novel, you could read it, Maybe gain some understanding or some, you know, whatever, inspiration maybe. But it's, without the presence of God, it's just a book. You see, there is no, there are no words found in the Bible that are not found in the English dictionary. Did you know that? <coughs> Every word in the Bible is also in the dictionary. Maybe a little off, depending on the translation or something. But here's the thing. Is the dictionary anointed? No. Of course not. What makes the Bible so powerful and living is because of the presence of God that is accompanied with it. It's because of the living word that it was that it was breathed into the, the hearts of men and the pen of men and women. You see. Everything changes in its presence. I, I don't want us to be caught in a place of getting, of being used to church used to the presence of God. Now see, I want to be, I want to be used to ha having it a normal part of my life. But I also understand that just like the prophet 
when he saw the Lord high and lifted up, sitting on his throne, he fell down on his face. I never want to lose that awe and reverence for the presence of God. I never want to lose that. I never want to come to a place where saying, and I hear people do it. Oh, God went in our church today. Hello, what changed? Seriously, what changed? Were you changed? Was somebody saved? Was somebody whatever? Did, did God change something? Because if his presence was really there, things will change. I, I have a friend of mine. She is a seer. She literally can see into the supernatural, and I absolutely believe it because she said things, she's, things that have happened. And I, it's a second nature for her to see an angel. I believe that. She can be sitting talking to you and say, oh, there's an angel. There. Now, now I, don't, I don't believe an angel worship, and neither does she. But I believe she's seeing them, and she sees them for a reason. There was one time I was preaching, and she saw an angel with a flaming sword following me as I was going back and forth around the stage. She said, I can see the angel and a flaming sword. Believe it or not, I don't care. But I, for her, that's second nature. But I never want to get to the place of the, the presence of God just being, treating it willy-nilly, like it's just, oh well. I like coming to church and having a good time. I do. I like to laugh. I like to laugh at you. <laughs> <laughs> but I never want to neglect or abandon the presence of God for any neighbor, anybody sitting beside me, any church, nothing. I never want to neglect the presence of God. And while most of you may come to church and say, well, that was a good service. I'm glad so-and-so was there. We're glad we did this or that. It's great. But did you meet God? Was the presence of God near you? Or did you get up and move? Or did you put on sunglasses or what else? Bless you. What did you do with the presence of God? Do you run and hide? Or do you run up to it and embrace it? So friends, I want us to embrace the presence of God. Because without the presence of God, I give up. I really do. I can't change you. I can't change me without his presence. What will you do with his presence? Let's pray. Father, this morning, you are great and greatly to be praised. And God, I don't want to ever ever throw away your presence. I never want to be in a place where the presence of God doesn't change me. I never want to be in a place where I am not pliable to you. God, I, I can only speak for myself. But my prayer is that each one of us here are, are, are the same. That we don't want to give up the presence. We won't trade the presence of God for anything in our lives. Nothing is that good. God, help us. Help us. Maybe we need to repent and converted. Maybe we just need to surrender to your will and not our own. Maybe we just need to take the time and say, here I am, Lord. Send me. Because your promise is that in your presence is a refreshing. 
Your promise in your presence is for us to be changed. Help us to walk into the presence and not hide ourselves. And so, God, we just ask that you would do this in our lives by your Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I am tired of Thank you.